My name is Emma Lilly and I'm the Registrar for HE Admissions here at University Centre Somerset. Um, so basically what that means is I am the person that's responsible for downloading and processing your UCAS application once you have um, made it and sent it through. Um, so once um, we receive your applications, they're obviously screened for entry criteria. And so it's really important that you tell us about all of your qualifications. So if the entry criteria for a course that you are applying for includes maths and English GCSE, make sure you include that on your application, because if you don't tell us, we don't know. So if you can make sure you tell us as much as possible, that's always going to help in the application process. Once your application is received and been screened for entry criteria, it's shared with the course leader and you may be invited for interview. You may um, receive an offer after after that process. Um, one of the things I want to say is that obviously as we are a small provider, you will get a personal service in terms of your admission, um, your application to us. So we're not using algorithms like some of the big organisations do. All of your all of the applications that come through to us here at the University Centre Somerset are read and looked at in detail um, and you can guarantee that your personal statement will be looked at and read rather than just some computer churning out an algorithm um, like some of the bigger universities do. So with all that said, I'm just going to now pass you on to my colleague Lisa, who will lead you through the application process. So thank you very much, Emma, for that introduction. My name is Lisa and I am the careers lead for Bridgewater and Taunton College. And I'm going to be talking to you about applying for higher education. Um, so not just through uh, to UCS at Somerset, but also just in general um, to make sure that you've got a good overview of the process. So what will we be covering? So as you can see, it's a range of different topics. The first is going to be looking at things like what is UCAS and how do I apply through the system? Then we're going to look at uh, what to include in your application, what is a personal statement and why it's important, and also the types of things that we want to see in a personal statement. Looking at things like your structure, your spelling, your grammar, these are really important. Don't expect to get it right on the first time round. It will take several goes. Also looking at references for applications who you can ask, as well as sort of handy hints and tips uh, and timeframes as well. And then we'll be looking at how we can help you um, with the process, not just in terms of answering questions today, which we will do at the end of the presentation, but in general, if you do have any um, needs for going through the application process or even for student finance um, then we can talk about how the uh, University Centre Somerset and BTC can help you with that. So what is UCAS? Well UCAS is one of those systems that people don't necessarily hear about until they actually have to use it. It stands for the University and Colleges Admission System. And it's important to remember that this system is basically the way that you will apply for higher education courses in the UK. It does cost to apply. It's £22.50 for one choice. Uh, and then if you want anything more than one choice up to five choices, then it's £27. Now it's important to remember that if you pay that £27, you have paid for up to that five choices, but you don't necessarily need to use all five. You can only um, apply once in a cycle. So unfortunately, it's not a case of using the system repeatedly in a single year. Each cycle is one academic year and you can only apply once through UCAS in that cycle. However, as I mentioned, you can apply for up to five courses on that one application. It's important to make sure though that when you're applying for your courses, when you're looking at those um, options, do your research. Don't just put down the closest place to you and hope that that will be OK. Make sure you get out to these universities, you look around, you ask questions, because this could potentially be three years of your life and you don't want to be spending it in the wrong place. 
Most important, though, is that your application must be good. If your application isn't good, then unfortunately, it's not going to make it through that first round of whether it be reading or being put through an algorithm, as Emma mentioned earlier. As she mentioned, here at UCS, we don't use an algorithm. We actually go through uh, personal statements and applications personally. But a lot of the larger universities do. And if you don't meet their requirements, they simply won't contact you. So in terms of actually applying through UCAS. So first of all, you need to get familiar with the UCAS page, the home page. And this is where you're going to be looking and doing your searches from. So you would put your uh, chosen course name into the search box, select the relevant level. Most of you, it's going to be undergraduate, and then you would be able to search courses from there. However, if you look in the top right hand corner of the screen, you'll see a small person icon. And if you click onto this, this will help you to get through and register to get into the hub. So when you register, they're going to ask you for set things. So make sure that you have these things to hand when you actually go through the process. So the first thing is you're going to complete your personal details. Now, your personal details for registration um, will be moved across into your application, so you won't have to do them twice. But these will include things like your name, and that would be first name and middle name if you have one and a surname as well as contact information. And it's important to remember that when you are applying that you are using an up to date email. Don't use your college email because most colleges at the end of an academic year will actually wipe their entire system of student emails so that they can start again fresh in the new year. What this means is, is if you've used your student um, identification and student ID for your email address and they try to contact you after it's been wiped, they will no longer be able to get hold of you. Also, you need to make sure that your email address is something that you can get onto fairly quickly because part of the registration process includes um, verification of that email. So they will ask you to add a code which will be sent to the email. It's relatively quick and simple. If you just copy and paste that code back in, you will then have actually registered. It will then give you the opportunity to get your username and your password sorted. Now, don't just store these on your phone just in case something happens to your phone, okay? Make sure that you write them down or you have a backup somewhere so that you know what your username and your password are because that is how you're going to access your application from this point forward. Once you've actually got the registration process completed, you will then go through to the actual hub itself and you will see that there are lots of tiles which will help with everything from helping to look for courses, talking about student finance through to help with writing your personal statement. However, once you've gone through that process, you will also see a tile that says complete application or app your application. If you click onto that, it will take you into the application proper. And that is what you are going to be filling in. And that is the application itself. So remember, when you're going through that process, part of the information that you've already given will have been moved across. So you don't need to worry about adding it again. But they will also ask you for additional information. So this could be things like um, your sexual orientation. It could be your nationality, your residency status. Now, some of these questions you don't need to answer and it's easy to find out which ones are compulsory and which ones are not. Compulsory fields will be marked with a red asterisk. Depending on the resolution of your computer, it may look like a little red blob next to the actual question itself. Those are the sections that you must answer. So regardless of how invasive you feel the question may be, it must have an answer. Many of the questions, however, do have a drop down box attached to them. And that will help you because most of the time the answers are either the first requirement or they will be near the top of the list. 
but you must remember to use what you've got on that list and not type in that box. If you type into the box that has been given to you, and in actual fact, it's a drop down menu, when you go to save it, it will not save. So remember, if there is a drop down menu, use that menu, it is there for a reason. So once you've got your personal details in there and that will, as I said, talk about things like your nationality, address, all of that kind of thing, then they're going to start asking about things like your education history. Now, your education history is something that a lot of students do tend to struggle with purely and simply because they're never entirely sure what they're meant to add. So when you add your education, the first thing you'll be required to add is the institution. So keep in mind, it is only the institutions that you gained qualifications from. For example, if you um, were at secondary school and that's where you did your GCSEs or O-levels, then you would put your secondary school in. Primary school, however, you do not do exams in, so you do not add your primary school. Also keep in mind that they will want your most recent education. So for argument's sake, if you are currently at a college or at a learning provider, you will also need to put that down as well. Once you've got the learning provider down, then you add your qualification to that. Now, don't expect to do the entire application in one hit because you are going to need specific information. And a good example of this is when you add your qualifications to your institutions, you will need all of the information on the certification. This will include not only the name, and that's the full name of the qualification and the grade and date that you did it, but also the awarding body as well. So for those of you who, for argument's sake have just done um, an, an A level or are doing access, that will be the first thing that goes on there. But you will also need to add those GCSEs down. And remember, many universities will not accept you if you don't have that information and you don't have your GCSEs. So do make sure that you get hold of the certification. And it's no use just finding one of those certificates and assuming that they're all done through the same awarding body. There are three awarding bodies for GCSEs and most people's GCSEs are done as a combination of those three. So you will need to dig those certificates out or find at least your results information because generally it will be on there as well. It may also ask you for module information. Now, if you're doing a diploma, for example, or you're doing an access course, then I would probably suggest that you include that module information purely and simply because it shows what you have been doing as part of your course. It will also give you the opportunity to add down grades because your current qualification has not been graded yet. Overall, the grade will come out as pending, but when you're putting in modules, then you can be specific. So for example, if you've gained a distinction or a distinction star in a module, and that is something you feel is super important, then you can put that in at the top. Once you've got your education history, they will also ask you about your employment history. Now, do keep in mind that it, you can only add in up to five employers. Uh, it's not like a CV where you would put a lot of them in. It's only five that you can include. So keep in mind that employment does not necessarily have to include paid employment. It can also include voluntary employment. So this means that when you're adding that employment history in, keep in mind that if you've been doing placements, if you've been doing volunteer work, if you've been doing um, additional work on top of any placements that you are paid for and it is voluntary, all of that can go in. And it is super important because an employer um, can give you, you know, really good references. And it also shows that you've gained certain skills whilst you're doing it. So things like working as part of a team, being able to show leadership qualities, those sorts of things are really important. Then you're going to look at your course choices. So make sure that when you're adding those course choices that you put down all of the ones that you're interested in. Keep in mind, however, that you do not need to put them in order of preference. The old system of first choice, second choice, third choice no longer applies. So do keep in mind that when you're putting them down, the other 
institutions will see that you've applied elsewhere, but they will not know in what order and they will not know where you have applied to. So don't worry about a university being put off by the fact you didn't choose them first. Those days have gone because basically universities were getting snippy with each other over who had gained first and second entry. Then we come to the personal statement and often this is the part that students struggle with the most and it's not surprising because your statement can be the make or break element of your application and we will look at that in a little bit more detail as we go through this presentation. Just keep in mind that your personal statement is just that, it is personal. It should not be written by someone else. It should not be copied from someone else. And so it's important to remember that when an employer, sorry, when a university is looking at your personal statement, they want to hear your voice. And if you're going in for interview, which for certain courses that are high demand, things like nursing or psychology and things like that, they are definitely going to want to see you face to face. They are going to find out pretty quickly if you sound like the person who wrote that statement. Now, some of you will need to add reference information. And if you are somebody who is not applying through a school or college, that will be you. In those instances, it would generally be acceptable for you to use a previous uh, or current employer. Um, but do keep in mind that when you add that reference information, um, that they will need to add the reference to your application before you send it off. If you're applying through the school or college, however, when you pay and send your application, it goes to a holding pool within the college and individual tutors are then able to view the application and add the reference and your predicted grades into that information. Then it's checked and sent. So if your application is showing that it's stuck at the college, it doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong. It just means that your referee hasn't put their reference on yet. In terms of paying and sending your application, you are going to need to have some form of credit or debit card in order to pay. Um, as I said before, you're looking at £22.50 for just one choice. So if that's just that one place you know you definitely want to go and you're not interested in applying elsewhere, that would be you. However, if you've got anything from two to five choices, that is the £27. Um, and that basically is a one-off payment. Now, do keep in mind that if if you have decided to go for say three choices which is a good number because it gives you two preferential treat, uh, choices and one that you can have as an insurance or a backup um, then you know keep in mind that you have still got those other two choices you have paid for up to five therefore that is still available to you and you can use that at a later date should you so wish so even once you've paid and sent your application, it doesn't mean that you can't add additional applications to it. It will just mean you cannot do it before the first on time deadline. So what do I include? Well, as I said, as we've been through each one of these sections, there are specific bits of information that we will want to see from you. The most important is an up-to-date email address, but also keep in mind your email address says a lot about you. In the same way that an employer will look at an email address and make a judgment, so can some universities. So if you have essentially a rude, crude or maybe a little bit silly email address, you might want to think again before adding it to your UCAS application. You know, consider if you're wanting to go into nursing and you've got bunnyboiler at hotmail.com as your email address, doesn't really send the right impression. So keep those sorts of things in mind and just make sure that the email address that you put down is one that you can access regardless of where you are and when it is. For some of you, you will need a buzzword. So if you are applying through a school or college, i.e. you are currently a student at a school or college, you will require a buzzword. Now, the buzzword is essentially a word that links into specific institutions and it will then allow that individual to put down the um, section that they are attached to in terms of the department. So it could be early years or engineering. 
It's important if you are applying through a school or college that you use that buzzword, because if you don't, then your referee will not be able to find you on the list of students. And do not use the default setting either. Make sure that you put yourself into the right tutor group. Now, it is possible for a tutor to request that you are moved from default into another area, but this will take time and can be a bit of a pain. So I would advise if you are going to be applying applying through your school or college. Number one, get your buzzword soon as soon as possible. And number two, make sure that you know which department to link your application into so the tutor can find it. As I said before, all mandatory fields are marked with a red asterisk, so do make sure that you fill them in. When you come to the end of each section, you will be asked to save it. It is not a self-save system. So do keep in mind that when you save a section, if it is coming up that it is not completed, the reason is often because you've missed out a mandatory section. If you go back, however, and scroll through the application, nine times out of ten, it will highlight that for you so that you can see what you've missed. Make sure that your residency status is correct. If you are a UK citizen, you are just needing to put down your residency status as UK national and that is it. You do not then need to fill in the dual nationality section with UK national. It will confuse the system into thinking that you are an international student or that you don't have the residency to stay in the UK. So remember, if you are UK national, you only fill in the first First part. If, however, you have a dual nationality, then you will pull, but fill in both of those sections. So the section about the first part of your nationality and then who, whichever um, the dual nationality section applies to is usually the other part of the passport you have. Make sure that you put down about your personal circumstances. So for argument's sake, are you working um, full time or part time? Those are sections in that application that will require you to answer them. They are mandatory fields. OK, so do make sure that you've got that down. And it will ask you about how you're going to fund your studies. Now, if you have done a degree previously and had a student loan for that degree, I would advise you strongly to speak with Student Finance England before applying for another degree programme. It may well be that you will not qualify for funding and would have to self-fund. For the vast majority of students, however, if you've never done a degree before, most people will go through the student loan system, which will be 02 on the list that comes up and it will say that it will be for student finance. Keep in mind, however, that if you do wish to self-fund your own studies, that is entirely possible as well. But I would recommend that you check to make sure that you know exactly how much money you will be spending for course fees to ensure that you still have money to live. Keep in mind also that smaller colleges and universities are often going to charge a lot less for their degrees. So it can be a really effective way of saving money by attending a smaller institution. If you want to go to a larger organisation or you want to go somewhere like London, it is going to cost more. London students do get more as part of their student um, loan, but do keep in mind whatever you borrow for your student loan, which is split into two sections, your tuition fees and your maintenance loan or living expenses, everything is ha will have to be paid back. There are rules regarding when you pay it back, how much you have to be earning to, in order to pay it back, but do keep in mind that essentially it is still a debt it's not quite the same as a bank debt, but it is still a debt. You will be asked about nominated access. Now, keep in mind that nominated access is important. UCAS is extremely hot when it comes to confidentiality. They will not talk to anybody but you about your application. If you were to go and speak to an advisor like myself and you wanted us to speak to them, you would actually have to give them authorization first by phone before they would even talk to us. So nominated access allows you to 
pre-nominate somebody in case you are not going to be available at any point during the process of application. So this could be that you're going away on holiday, you've got a gap year um, excursion planned, whatever it is, nominated access is always worth considering. It's not compulsory, but we would advise you use it. As I said earlier, make sure that you're only adding qualifications with regards to the schools and colleges that you got them from. Do not add primary schools, don't add other learning establishments if you didn't get qualifications from them. That's especially true if you attended more than one secondary school, for example, you would only put the one down that you gained your qualifications through. Make sure you've got that certification handy. It makes things a lot quicker when you actually sit down to actually write uh, your, your personal statement and also when it comes to writing out your application. If you have not got all of your qualifications completed, remember the ones you are still doing will be down as pending. It's important if you try to put down a grade, even if it's a predicted grade that your tutor has given you, the system will not allow you to save it. You can then add up to those five employers. If you don't have up to five employers, don't worry, it's fine. Students, especially who are in college for the first time, they're not necessarily going to expect you to have all five. Then make sure that you've got your course choices. Make sure to go through and check, have you got the right course? Because when you put your institution in, it will give you a, a list of courses that will basically only be available at that institution. However, it is always possible that there is more than one course with that name. For example, if you apply for early years, is it a degree, a foundation degree or a top up that you're actually applying for? So make sure you check before you save. Make sure then you use your space wisely when you're doing your personal statement. If you don't, it will not allow you to save it. You have limited space, so use it wisely. And then if you need to add reference information, then you would add it in at this point. However, if you are going through a school or college, you don't need to worry about that. So what is your personal statement and why is it so important? Well, there are many parts to a personal statement, but it can be the make or break part of an application. The most important thing to keep in mind is the reason it's so important is that if you are a university admissions team and you have applications coming in from students and all of those applications are going to be very similar in terms of the actual qualifications the students are doing, the grades that those students have gained. Really what tells that student's application apart from another is the personal statement and that's why it's so important. It can literally be the make or break element of your application. So make sure that when you are writing your statement that you take the time and plan it before you start. There are many different ways that you can plan statements. That could be a mind map. It could be quite literally making columns of what you need to include, things that are important, things that don't need to be included. Or you could even try the post-it method whereby you have a fresh pack of post-its and a pencil. You take them around with you all day, scribbling down bits and maybe keep it with you for a couple of days. By the end of it, you should have a nice wadge of post-its with different bits and items ideas on it and the great thing is that you can then use those sticky notes to put them on the walls, the floors, the ceilings, wherever you want to be doing but you can move them about. So it allows you to actually make a plan before you actually start writing and that is important. Don't just sit in front of a computer and expect to bang out all of the required characters or lines without a plan first. Now, it will tell you that you have 4,000 characters and 47 lines as your allowance. So what does that actually mean in reality? So the 4,000 characters includes spaces and punctuation. With that said, it also it will include all of your line breaks. It will also include any paragraph breaks you add. So it's important to make sure that when you're planning your uh, statement that you think about structure. When you are putting in your application, when you're doing your personal statement, 
make sure that you use a word processing document to do the statement because there is no spell or grammar check on UCAS on the actual application system. So make sure that you've got that there whilst you're doing it because you can then email that off to people for proofreading. When, when you're getting someone to proofread it, essentially what you're doing is you're making sure that your spelling, your grammar, everything like that is correct. It is important because spelling, grammar, punctuation, and even the way that you've planned out your statement can have a massive impact on the person reading it. So, you know, keep in mind that the 4,000 characters is only just over a sheet of A4 if you're using a word processing document with a minimum font size of 12. It's not actually that much. And 47 lines is even less. So when you're looking at doing your statement, do it first on a word processing document so that you can copy, paste, you can change bits around, you can get it proofread, you can get it checked. And it will also include on most um, computers will include a character check and you want the one with spaces and it will then give you the character allowance. If it's over 4000 characters in your first draft, don't panic. That often happens because people don't realise just how much um, 4000 characters really is or how little it is. Um, but make sure that as you're starting to go through that proofreading phase and you're going through the um, phase of actually doing different drafts and, and changing your statement and amending parts, that's when you need to start looking at that character allowance. Make sure that you do get that proofreader to go through it as well, because if you're trying to proofread your own document, often, unfortunately, you are going to miss sections. Um, I've seen students miss out entire words uh, and in some instances, parts of whole sentences because your brain knows what you want to say. So it fills the gaps in for you, whereas somebody who's proofreading it has no clue what it's meant to say and can read it verbatim and hopefully then help you with getting that right. You can use quotes, absolutely, but do keep in mind that a quote is generally a small part of a sentence or it may be an entire sentence. It's not a whole paragraph. Um, that is important because plagiarism is something that UCAS take very seriously and they have a system called copy check and what that, uh, sorry, copy catch. And what that does is it goes through the actual personal statement part of your application and it scans it for words and phrases and documents that it's seen before. If too much of your statement comes out as being plagiarised, it will give it a percentage. Once it goes over a certain percentage, it will then also contact the universities to say that a lot of this personal statement has been copied. And believe me when I say you do not want that because some universities will simply blacklist you for the year and other universities would demand that you actually rewrite a personal statement from scratch. So make sure if you are going to use quotes, you only use a line here or there and make sure they make sense. Um, you know, if you're going to be using you know, statements from somebody like uh, Muhammad Ali, which is very common, or Mahatma Gandhi, make sure they're in context. You know, there's no point in using um, a, a quote from Mother Teresa if you're going to be using it for something that's completely out of context. Most importantly, though, show your passion for your subject. But if you can avoid using the word passion, passion or any derivative thereof, then it would definitely be beneficial. Um, passion is one of those words that is very much overused in the same way that um, things like the Duke of Edinburgh Bronze Award is overused. Many people have it and it's often included. So make sure that when you're doing your personal statement that you're adding in your passion and your interest for a subject. But if you can avoid using that particular word, it is going to be beneficial for you. So what do we want to see in your personal statement? Well, as a college uh, and university centre Somerset, we want to see why. Why do you want to study this subject and why should we put you on a course to study that subject? So make sure you're specific. Make sure that you've got references to any sector, sector specific study previously undertaken. For example, if you're doing access to nursing and you want to do a nursing degree through UCS, 
then tell us, but also reference work experience, specific governing bodies, um, any particular personal or professional reasons why we should take you onto that course. And it is super important because when you're adding in things like the uh, Nursing and Midwifery Council, um, admissions are going to read that and they're going to tick a box to a certain extent and say, yes, this person knows what they're talking about. They've done their research. They've looked at where they want to go and why they want to do this. They've got relevant work experience. That's what we are looking for. Most universities are not dissimilar, but do keep in mind that when you go to open days with universities, most of them will give you hints and tips with regards to what they want to see. So if a university has specifically told you during an open day that they want to see something in a personal statement or see it referenced in some way, make sure you do. Even if you're applying to more than one university, often, especially if you're going for subjects that are in the same vein or are the same subject, it's essentially just then a generic statement that you're putting together that hits all of those parts you've been asked to include. If you are trying to get into courses that are vastly different, however, you will struggle to write a statement that covers all of them. Um, things like, for example, students trying to get into midwifery and nursing, they very rarely succeed because it's practically impossible to write a statement that hits both of those high demand areas straight the first time. So if I was you, number one, pick the area you want to go into. And number two, make sure it doesn't clash or compete with other areas you might be applying to. Um, speak to a careers advisor if you're in any way unsure. So in terms of what we're looking for, other things are also important in terms of things like structure, spelling, grammar. So don't just write one solid block of text. If you've ever been in the situation of actually reading something that's just a, a solid block, it's so, so hard and laborious. So we would advise three paragraphs is a good use of your space. Um, it will help you also to space things out. And you can also write paragraphs out of order. You don't have to start with paragraph one and, and then go to two and three. You can start with paragraph three, then go to one, then go to two. It's up to you. Make sure you check your spelling. And again, this is where things like word processing documents and proofreaders um, you know, are going to help you because, as we've said, don't rely on spell checkers on uh, a lot of systems. They are Americanized. They will only use Americanized system um, updates. So you know, if you are going to be getting spell checks, make sure that you're also getting that from your proofreader. Um, concentrate on the grammar as well. You know, don't write a sentence that just keeps going and going and going and going or using lots and lots of commas. Um, you know, full stops are invented for a reason, so please do use them. Poor spelling and grammar can affect your application negatively. Um, as uh, Emma mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, it can be for certain universities that they will literally feed your statement through an algorithm. And if that number comes out at the end too low, they will simply just say no. So keep in mind that, you know, admissions do read thousands of statements. Uh, the larger the institution, the more they're reading. Um, so as a consequence, you know, but then when they're looking at statements, they are looking for something specific they want them to, to stand out in a good way. Um, yeah, and as a consequence, they will have three piles, the good, the bad, and the maybe. The good pile is generally the smallest of the three. The bad pile is kind of a, a slightly a larger one, but the maybe pile is often the one they have to go back and review. Um, however, in smaller institutions like ours, often it is simply a yes and no pile because we're able to give you that personal touch straight off the bat. So don't expect things to be right the first time. You know, you are going to write multiple variations of your statement. I've yet to come across a student who is capable of writing a statement straight out the first time and it being absolutely perfect. It is no, in no means um, you know, meant to be an insult if you're told to rewrite it. Planning, making sure you get everything in there the first time is important. So make sure that planning goes ahead. And also, you know, if you're given information on what they want to see, make sure you include it. Don't try to apply for different programs um, that are too wildly uh, end at two ends of the spectrum because you're just not going to be able to cover all that information. Um, 
any experience, employment experience, both paid and unpaid, is valid. Um, you know, voluntary experience, placement experience, include all of that because it can make the difference. They want to use your voice. So if you are using technical language or language that is much more complex than what you usually would, they are going to pick up on that quite quickly. Uh, explain how this course would feed into your chosen career path, because that's really what they're looking for is where is this going to take you? Also talk about, you know, um, what obstacles have you overcome to get to where you are? And that could be obstacles in education, obstacles in terms of getting placements. It could be just general life obstacles. Um, but those sorts of things are actually really powerful when you put them in the right way in a statement. Um, but do, again, talk to universities to, to see what they're looking for, because they will be there to help you. So. These are just some helpful hints and tips that we've kind of put together that will help you as you go through your application. The most important is don't rush. OK, yes, there is a deadline, but if you've given yourself enough time, keep in mind that applications open at the start of September. You shouldn't need to rush. Applying early can be useful and for in-demand courses that fill up quickly, absolutely. Uh, for things like nursing, for example, in bigger universities, we would advise that you apply by end of October, middle of November. Um, however, if it goes through to December, um, it's not going to be the end of the world. Technically, they are not allowed to allocate places until the uh, on-time deadline has passed. Make sure that you've got those qualifications to hand, then you're not having to worry about things like awarding body information. Um, and also look for those mandatory areas, make sure that you've completed them. If there is that drop down list, make sure that you use it. And as I said before, this is not a self save system, so it will require you to actually save as you go through and make sure at the end of each section, once you have finished it, you section complete it. There's a little box that you tick, then you save it. Uh, make sure that when you do that section complete, you double check to make sure that you've got a tick in the box. If you have, you've done it. If you haven't, go back and check which bits you've missed out. So reference information, who can you ask? Well, if you've been in education within the last three to five years, generally they are going to want to see an academic reference. So you should be asking your tutor um, or it could be somebody within the college that has taught you a specific part of a subject that you feel would be a good referee for you. Um, as a general rule, it's not something that they would say no to. The only time that they may you know, not be able to do it is if they're no longer with the institution. So it is always worth looking into that as soon as you possibly can when you've made that decision to go to university. If you're over that five years, then generally most universities will expect um, a reference from a current or former employer. And again, it doesn't have to be a paid employer. You know, if you've got placement with a, an organisation and they are happy to provide you with a reference that you feel is not only going to be positive, but also is going to be relevant to the subject you are applying for, then I would definitely suggest using that person um, and not worrying too much about whether they're current or former is really about what they're going to be saying unless it's sort of you know five years past you know you need to have something that's relatively recent your reference essentially is providing information um, to the higher education institution about things like how they feel you would cope with higher education or whether they feel you've chosen the right course. You know, if you're doing a placement within an organisation, you know, they will quite quickly be able to tell, you know, if this person's good at what they're doing and would it a degree be useful for them so they can really help you out with that. Now, unfortunately, though, um, you can't have more than one reference. Um, so, you know, sometimes we will have students who will come in and they will quite literally have you know, five or six references from various different employers. Um, and that's great. But unfortunately, you can only have one. So what we would advise in that instance is maybe pick the one that you feel is the most relevant uh, and the most up to date. And then maybe use sections of those other statement uh, references as part of your statement you know use them as quotes um, or you can always take the reference information with you to interview 
can never guarantee that they're going to be able to read all of them. Um, but if they're sort of short, sharp and to the point, then often they will be able to look them through. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, this is something where an employer has seen you in action. They can give a much more up to date and honest reference to what you're capable of doing, sometimes actually surprising even yourself. Uh, we quite often get uh, students who have had references from people where they've really picked them up and, and it surprised the student and, and touched them as well. So, you know, do kind of keep that in mind when you're choosing a referee. You know, they can be just as important for your application as a reference uh, or a statement from someone else. So when should I apply? It is important um, to remember that there are deadlines for UCAS. And so these are the ones that you need to keep in mind. So the first one is with regards to the deadline for if you're wishing to study at Oxford, Cambridge, or if you wish to study medicine, dentistry or veterinary science. You will quite often hear this 15th of October deadline banded about by people. If you do not fall into any of those specific sections, you can ignore it. You do not need to worry about it. Uh, the vast number of students that we deal with do not fall into this category. However, if you do, you need to make sure that you move quickly to get your application in. So, you know, speak to your tutors, speak to careers advisors and get that help at that point. The second deadline is what we refer to as the on time deadline, and this is basically for all other applications. Um, the 25th of January is the deadline that we tend to push people towards as the one that we will use ourselves. Keep in mind, however, some tutors will give you a deadline of before Christmas, for example, um, and that often is so that they have time to write references and do your predicted grades and make sure that everything is, is OK before they send off your application. Um, you know, if you are applying through a school or college, so don't panic if it doesn't go off, you know, before Christmas when you've sent it in. Um, it will go off once the tutor is ready to send it. Um, but this again is where it's useful if you know that you want to apply early, that you speak to your tutor, let them know that so that when you get your application finished, you can let them know and then they can do their part for you. So the 18th of May is the decision deadline for on time applications. So basically any application up to the 25th of January will basically you will get a decision for by the 18th of May. If, however, you have applied after the 25th of January, you are classed as a late applicant. It's not the end of the world by any stretch of the imagination. And many late applicants still get places on courses, but they will not find that out until after the 18th of May. So the 8th of June is the deadline to reply for on time offers. So you have applied before the tw 25th of January. You have had your offer, uh, your decision come through by the, before the 18th of May. And then you have to reply to them before the 8th of June. Um, sometimes they will give you other deadlines, but this is the main deadline. So do make sure using the track system, which is also on the UCAS website, um, that you do keep an eye on your applications because often that's where you can actually accept or decline a place on a course. The 4th of July is the deadline for late applications. So as I said, anything after the 25th of January is late. Um, so you have up until the 4th of July to get your application in before it, uh, it is classed as basically going into clearing. And for those of you who are not aware, starts from the 5th of uh, July and it is essentially the end of season sale. It's when all the universities get together uh, and explain that, yes, we have these course uh, courses available and these spaces on these courses. The difference is, is instead of you sending the application to UCAS and UCAS contacting them, you will actually have to phone the universities directly. It is not something we would recommend. Um, you know, if you want to go to university, either go for an on-time uh, application or a late application. Clearing, it is still possible to get on, but it does, you know, sort of put you in a precarious dis, uh, position because there's no guarantee that the course or place on the course you want to do is going to be available. So how can we help you? So it's important to remember that our careers team um, at the college doesn't you do not need to be a student here to use it. So, you know, we can help you with things like one to one support with UCAS. So if you need help applying, 
that's no problem. We can provide you with um, careers guidance and course advice, as well as help with applying for student finance and understanding student finance. Um, and then also personal statement support, everything from helping you to plan right the way through to helping you to get the application, uh, get your statement right, um, proofreading it, sending it back to you uh, and making sure that it gets sent off on time. But the key thing to keep in mind is that this application, part of the process is something that you know, universities expect you to do to make sure that actually we've got the right people applying. So, you know, we can't do it for you, but we can offer you assistance. And in terms of helpful information, the first email address you have here is the one for UCAS.com. That is basically the central um, UCAS application. So it will give you the home page and then everything spans from there. If you would like to speak to careers, and that can literally be to ask a question or request an appointment, you can either email us via careers at btc.ac.uk or you can call us on 01823 366 510. If you want to look at student finance, um, we've got the www.gov.uk forward slash student finance um, email there, uh, sorry, website there. And then you've got the 0300 100 0607 number there for you to contact them directly on. Um, and you can also contact our student support team via student support at btc.ac.uk and they can actually help you with the process of applying through student finance. Um, so they basically deal with all of our financial guidance, all of um, you know, the bursaries and things like that that you can also apply for. So they are definitely worth having a chat with. And as you can see, that is all from me. So I'm going to uh, now pass over to anybody wishing to ask questions uh, and speak with Emma. Thank you, Lisa. That was an incredibly um, thorough and comprehensive uh, review of the process. Um, we'll stop the recording here and then we'll throw the floor open to anybody who has got any questions.